songs right there. I liked them a lot. They, they tie right in with the sermon today. Uh, and we're talking about how we need to rely on the Spirit right there. And there's a Spirit and the way that we were saved. You know, God saved us. And it's by His, by nothing we did of our own selves, God saved us. And it's the same way that we stay saved is by the Spirit that keeps us saved right there. It's nothing that we do of our own works. It's nothing we do of our own struggles and things like that. It's what God did for us. And it's just us relying on Him. And he just keeps coming through. And we're always going to fall short. So fortunately, all that grace is involved. Where he just keeps pouring out more grace and keeps helping us to bring us through all the way to the end. I really like that. That was some good stuff. But uh, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Galatians chapter 5. It's uh, only one more week left of Galatians. And then I'll be it. But I tell you, Galatians has been a good thing. I really enjoyed reading through Galatians and uh, studying it and sharing it with you guys. And uh, I've got some great stories here. I've got a few more notes than I usually have up here. I know I don't usually read my notes, but they were so good, I had to get some of them. And uh, I wanted to put this picture in your mind right now. Is, you know, with the whole thing of Galatians is fighting between legalism, between people who had become Christians, and then the Jews who were very strict under the law of Moses that you had to do so many things. They even right, wrote their own book, I think it was called the Mishnah, that they had even more commandments on how to follow all the rules. And it was so much oppression and so much legalism holding them down that it was just horrid. And they were trying to take the people back who'd been saved and were following Jesus back into this bondage, that this, this human religion type of way for sin that, that really is separation from God. And, and Paul's really having it out with them as he's going through the book of Galatians. And I got this great picture here about legalism or the opposite of it is called antinomianism, which basically means that you can, you can go to church but then live like the devil the rest of the week and you're just fine. And that's not the way it is either. There's a place in between is where we need to be. But it says, the stream of legalism is clear, sparkling, and pure. But its waters run so deep and furiously that no one can enter it without being drowned or smashed on the rocks of its harsh demands. The stream of libertini, libertinism by contrast, it's relatively quiet and still. In crossing, it seems easy and attractive. But its waters are so contaminated with poisons and pollutants that to try to cross it is also certain death. Both streams are incrossable and deadly, one because of impossible moral and spiritual demands, the other because of moral and spiritual filth. You know, because so, so there's one side where, you know, we're trying to be so legalistic like uh, Maybe some of these churches where like I can only read one version of the Bible. I gotta have my hair long down to the ground. If I'm a lady, I gotta have dresses that touch the ground. If I'm a guy, I gotta do this and I've got to do that. And if you don't fit this mold, then get out of here. You're not part of one of us that's going to heaven right there. And that's just one example. There's a lot of different things. Almost every false religion has legalism. Uh, the Muslims, the Muslims, they're under such strict things right there. Got, that kind of goes to the Muslims there too. I've seen them with the burqas on, all these different things. And it's so much strictness. And if you ask a Muslim, if you say, if you die today, would you be in heaven today? They'd be like, I don't know. If they're a good Muslim, because they don't know. They don't know, because it's by works. They're trying to balance the scales. And we know that we can never balance the scales. Jesus Christ paid it all on the cross. And either we put our faith in Him, where all our price has been paid and we're secured, or we don't. And we try to balance the scale, and it's impossible to balance the scale. That's why the Moses brought the law and all those commandments in the Old Testament. It was to let us be crushed and let us know, I need a Savior. I need Jesus Christ. I don't have any hope unless I have God, because I can't do it on my own. It's impossible for me to follow these laws. But then on the other hand, like this story said, there's that stream of libertinism, which uh, is really easy to cross, it's shallow, but its pollutants are so poisonous and deadly it'll kill you when you go over there. And that's like, you know, the easy believism that, like I said, the antinomianism where I can, I can uh, you know, believe one way on Sunday, live like the devil the rest of the week, and I'm just fine and I'm going to heaven. Now, the best picture for that is Rasputin, the monk right there. Rasputin in 1900 to 1914 or 16 there in Russia. He was a, a priest and he was also a very evil man at the same time. And uh, I'm sure things didn't work out that good for him in the end right there. But that's, that's the truth right there. And uh, Christ doesn't give us freedom to believers so that we can do what we want. 
but so that we can do for the first time what God wants because of our love for him. That's why we've got the freedom and everything, so that we can serve him, so we're able to. Because if we try to do it on our own, we're always going to fall short. We're going to be so crushed and things like that. So, let me get on with this. I've got a couple of interesting stories like that for you guys, too. I hope I'm able to get to them. But verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Slavery when we were underneath all these rules and all this bondage. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again that every man who accepts circumcision, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who want to sell you would emasculate themselves. For you were called the freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. All right, there's tons of truth in here. There's a lot of, I could probably make six different sermons out of this, but I'm only going to make one sermon out of the whole chapter. But let me point out to you here some great things here. It says, it says in verse 5, it was through the Spirit by faith. That how that we got our hope of righteousness. It's through the Spirit by faith. Uh, we've talked about Ephesians before. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It says, I can't say I was saved in myself. I can say that I didn't do anything. That it was all God. That I may not boast. I can't say I did this and that's why I was saved. God opened my eyes. God drew me. And I responded with faith and repentance right there. There wasn't anything of my own self that got me saved. It was all God right there. And it points out too, it says, it says, he tells him, he goes, you guys were running well. Paul must have been a bit of an athlete himself, or he must have been one of these sports guy watchers, you know, like the guys today watch Browns or football all the time, because he makes a lot of analogies to running the race and physical endurance and Olympic type things. But he says, you were running well, and who stopped you from running well? Who hindered you from the truth? And he says, a little leaving leavens the whole lump. We keep talking about leaving because uh, for the past few weeks we've had unleavened bread for communion, which is nice. And then in the Bible it kind of symbolizes that leaven is like sin. You know, when, and then when it's unleavened, it doesn't have the sin put into it right there. And he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know, so a little bit of, I don't know if leaven is yeast or what exactly it is. I should look down more, but a little bit of yeast will get in the whole thing right there, the yeast. It'll really spread through. And this is the poison that happened with these guys that were Jews before who come back in the church and they said, you guys have to be circumcised. If you want to be a believer, you have to look like us. You have to be like us. And I'm sure they weren't like all oh, showing each other the circumcision or something like that. They were probably honest with each other being like, hey, I'm circumcised or you're not circumcised, but you need to get circumcised. But Paul here, he even goes to the extreme. He says, he, he talks about like, if you think that that's what's going to save you, I wish you'd go all the way. He says in verse, he says in verse 12, I wish those who want to sell you would emasculate themselves. That means castrate themselves. I mean, it says right there, we're proud. That's what, that's what Paul said. He goes, I wish you would go the whole way. If you want to take it to this extreme, go the entire way to that extreme. Go ahead and emasculate yourself. And there was even a cult in that day called the Cyberneans. And these guys, that was part of their cult. If you were a deeply devoted fellow, you'd have to castrate yourself. Imagine what terrible thing it would be a part of that thing. There wouldn't be many families like that. <laughs> well, at least not from the more mature believers. <laughs> Both guys here wouldn't have been any families. But it was a bad thing. And it wasn't something that was good right there. But he's pointing out that, you know, he goes, you know, try, try to obey the whole truth. If you want to stand underneath the law, then go ahead and obey the whole law. Because 
And many times in the Bible, it points out that the whole reason for the law, the law of Moses, you know, we've talked about two different covenants last week. We talked about the covenant of Abraham. Abraham was saved by faith, and righteousness was accounted to him because he believed. And then we talked about Moses, who put out the book of the law and all these demands and all these strictness and everything, like in the book of Leviticus and different things. And the whole point of all this stuff Moses put wasn't bad because it had a purpose. It had a purpose to put the crushing weight of the law down upon us that we realize we're not good enough to get to heaven on our own, that we need something else, and it should lead us to Jesus Christ, that he died for us, that he paid all the price for our sins, and that's what makes us good enough to go to heaven because he's died for us and he already paid the entire penalty and made us so we were able. So we're not working our own way to heaven. We may be working out our salvation in the sense that we're that we're growing each and every day in God, that we're trying to uh, choose each day. Today I'll serve God, I'll, I'll grow with Him, I'll, I'll put His Word in my heart. But it's not something that, that at the end of the day, if I've messed up and I fail, I'm not out of the bunch. You know, I'm not, I'm not an unsaved man. I'm not going from saved to unsaved to saved. It doesn't work that way. It says about Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, that's impossible for one who was saved to return to the truth right there if he should fall away. Which, you know, it tells me that since it's impossible, there's no one who is truly saved who will fall away right there. You know, some people may not have ever been saved in the first place who go away. But, but we can know for sure that God has that. I mean, some people try to take verse 4 and says, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you've fallen away from grace. And they take that one verse and they say, See that? You can lose your salvation. You could walk away from God and not go to heaven one day. But you know, when we read the Bible, we have to take it as a whole. We have to look at the entire Bible, see what other things said. And there's a mountain of verses that talk about how, how those who are in his hand, the sheep that God has given Jesus right there, will never be lost from him. Did he know he's not lost one? You know, we, he talks about over and over again that our salvation is secure, it's true. That he's the one to say that says, he that began a good work in you will finish the good work in you. Okay, the promises are God talking. God doesn't lie. It's his word and it's pure and it's true. So we've got to look at all that and the scope against like a few verses like this one saying, you know, you've fallen away from grace because what it is is he's letting them know like, hey, you know, you're not under the grace. You've never even been saved. You don't even have Jesus. If you think you've got to be circumcised and you've got to do this and you've got to do that because it's not true right there. You can't put yourself under that bondage. And I think so many times we can really relate to this in our own lives. We may try to think, well, I have to do this, and I have to do that. If I'm a good Christian, I'm going to do this. And maybe it wasn't even in the Bible, all those things we just thought about. And then we think, oh, you know, I'm not, maybe, I'm not even saved. I question my salvation. And I think what it is is we start trying to work our way. Because how does it work in the real world here? This is even more real world here, but in our world right here, if a, if a guy doesn't work, a guy doesn't eat usually, right? Or if a guy does, uh, doesn't work hard, he doesn't get promoted. Or if a guy uh, doesn't try to do anything with his life, maybe he'll work at McDonald's all of his life. You know, I mean, it's like a, a works-based thing is how we have in our society. But, but with God, it's not a works-based thing. I mean, everything was paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. Every one of our sins, so that we could enter heaven, because it was impossible that anybody could do it on their own. If it was possible that any of us could be good enough to go to heaven on our own, Jesus would not have had to come and die. He didn't come and die for like those that weren't able to do it. He came and do it for all of us, because none of us were able to get to heaven or to be good enough right there. And these Jews were trying to come in, and the circumcision is probably just one thing. There's probably more than that they were trying to bring in on the heavy bondage of the law to these guys. And he said, I wish they'd just go and emasculate themselves. I mean, I was thinking, whoa, that's some strong language. But Paul was pretty, he's very passionate as he preaches this. He, he was like a missionary, and he came through, he was like a church planner, and got these guys saved, led them to Jesus right there, and then he went away, and then he heard about what was going on again, and that's when he wrote the book of Galatians. And even though it's so harshly, it still ended up in the Bible in a letter. Imagine some, imagine some people were very offended when they read this book of Galatians because they thought that they were doing good and they didn't want to hear it a different way. But Paul really clarifies things for him and frees him. It's really a very freeing book. But, uh, but verse 13 is a big one. It says, For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So just because we're free, we're not like uh, Rasputin over here. It means that we can just do whatever we want to do. Who cares? You know, it's my life, my freedom. Really, uh, I think in our society, we see freedom as being able to do whatever we want to do. You know, I'm free from law. It's kind of like when I was a young kid, I always had these strange aspirations, and one of them was to be a biker. 
I wanted to be a biker. I wanted to have all the leather stuff on. I wanted to ride free and drink beer and chase girls and do all these crazy things as a young guy. I remember I read books about these guys that did it. It didn't talk about the books on how they go to jail or how their lives are all messed up or different things like that. But I thought that's what real freedom is. And really that's our society's culture saying what real freedom is. The freedom that God says is free is we're free to do the right thing. We're free not to be slaves of sin, slaves of the devil. We're free to do the right thing and, and, be, and be right and be holy and be just. We're free to follow him truly in, in the spirit and the truth. Like he talked about to Nicodemus in John 3.3. 3, it says you must be born again. You must be born of uh, spirit and of water. And he talks about a spirit and of truth. You know, he's talking about a much more freedom, a much more greater thing than just some, some kind of thing like that. You know, we'd still be bondage. We don't get uh, bikers like that, you know, totally free. Eventually, we're going to spend some time in jail. And anybody who's been in jail knows that life's not free right there. Living in a little cell, it's a terrible thing. But it says, verse 14, it says, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. It's actually like uh, seven words here. <laughs> it says, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. And it's, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, if you have that love toward others and things, and that love toward yourself, you really have that. Think about the freedom I pictured, like with the biker thing, or maybe how some of America pictures freedom, that we can do whatever we want to do, no rules, no restrictions. Really, that's not being free. Really, I'm a, becoming a narcissist, a lover of myself, an egocentric fella. If I think that it's all about me and I can do whatever I want to do, and that's all it is, is me. Because how is that going to affect the next guy next to me? That's going to make things real hard on him because my decisions are going to somehow mess up him. Say, in my yard, say, I wanted a, the, my neighbor's part of my neighbor's property. I thought, well, it's free. It's mine. I'm going to take it. Well, now it's not free for him anymore because now he just lost part of his yard right there. We've got to have, we've got to have the right picture on what freedom is. And what freedom is is being able to follow Christ in truth and in spirit, being able to really be right in God's eyes right there. And, uh, and uh, I like the, the best saying that helps me picture things is we were saved when we first believed in Jesus Christ, one time justification. And it's Jesus has saved us. And then it's the Holy Spirit that continues to save us as we grow through life. And we get sanctification. You know, right when we're saved, we're saved where we are. We come as we are, right in our sin. And as we grow through life, we get more holy. We get to be more like God. We don't have to like be all these strict ruler followers. And that's what makes us more holy. We're more holy because we're truly free to be really following Him and not under the slave bondage of what we were in before. And then we get saved completely the day we die and we go into glory. And God translates us from, from death to life. And we pass through that, that river Jordan and we're on there on the other side and we're in heaven. And then there's no more struggle of sin in the flesh because we're no longer in the flesh. But it says the whole law is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out. To warn, it says, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. You know, he's saying like, stop the fighting. There's, this was probably an issue that was causing fighting in the church too. Maybe one guy was like, I don't want to get circumcised. Leave me alone. And they were running after him with a knife maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but he was like, no, I don't want that. And uh, it was causing all these troubles. And it's never supposed to be like that. There shouldn't be fighting. It's like that. I, I, wrote down, I wrote down here, I saw this great thing. It's, it's not about, there's a difference between us. We can have debates. We can reason. We can discussion. We can have disagreement between one another. That's all fine. You know, none of us are going to exactly agree on the exact same thing. We're all going to have some different opinions, different ways we view things, different ways we understand things. But to fight, to have war, and to provoke is wrong. We shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be bringing a disagreement between one another so far that we're going to separate one another and we're never going to talk to one another again. And that's it. It shouldn't be like that. Especially if, if Jesus... You know, the Son of God is our God right there, that this is the Word of God. There's going to be small differences, and we can discuss, debate, reason, discuss them amongst each other, but they shouldn't separate us to the point. I tell you, if we were to be completely on the same page and everybody in here had to be on the same page as everything I view in here, it would be a smaller church than what we have now. It may be me and one other person. And eventually me and that other person would disagree, and then it would just be me. <laughs> it would get back to that real egocentric narcissist thing right there. We're going to see things a little differently in different things, and uh, that's okay. You know, our two most basic things that we should see the right way that Paul went to war about in a lot of his epistles and letters like this one 
is that, is that who Jesus is, you know, Jesus is God the Son, sent from the Father, God in the flesh, Almighty, and that, uh, and that, he, that He's the only way, He's the truth and the life, and we really have the right Jesus. And the second thing is, is how we're saved. Like the whole book of Galatians goes on, we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace, through faith. You know, we're saved for free, it's costing us free, it doesn't cost us anything to get saved, it's God's free gift to us. You can't pay for a free gift, you can't earn a free gift. I mean, you could like buy a raffle ticket and try and win a free gift, but essentially you kind of paid a dollar at least for that gift right there because you had to buy a raffle ticket, whatever the raffle ticket costs. It's a completely free gift right there. And it says here, so we've got to be careful not to get that fighting going on. And if we see ourselves getting toward that level of fighting, we need to stop and be like, hey, I apologize, Sammy. I said some things that were too harsh or too wrong to you, and I don't mean to take it in that direction right there. You know, I don't want to have fighting like that, but we can. We should be able to reason, debate, disagree with one another, and it's by that that we kind of hone each other and help each other grow. But here in verse 16 it says, "But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh." You know, if we're living by the Spirit, we're not living in the flesh right there. But the desires of all the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions and divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. All right? There's some big things there. Now, like we read, we read one group of things that are bad things, and we read one group of things that are good things. Now, we know that there's a lot more bad things than the things we just read. And likewise, there's a lot more good things than the things we just read, too, for the fruits of the Spirit. Some people are like, there's just nine fruits of the Spirit, or there's just this and there's that, because they just count word by word. But you can go through the Bible, and you'll find a whole lot more than nine. There's a whole bunch of fruits of the Spirit, a whole bunch of good things. And there's a whole bunch of bad things. Like some people are like, well, what does it say about this in the Bible? Well, I don't know. Maybe the Bible doesn't mention that at all. But, you know, maybe like somebody, I saw somebody arguing saying, what does the Bible say about uh, drunkenness? Or not drunkenness, but just, just drinking, but not quite to the point of drunkenness. And what I like was uh, one person said, the Bible definitely says addictions are bad. We shouldn't have an addiction controlling our life. So maybe we even just drink like one beer a day every day. But take that one beer away that one day, are you going to be having a fit? Are you going to be having some huge struggle and problem and stuff like that because you didn't get to have your one beer? Perhaps that's becoming an addiction. That's something that's starting to rule you. I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with drinking one beer, you know, if you drink one beer. But if you just picture on your own life, if you could take that out of your life or if you missed it the one day, would your whole life fall apart right there because you're putting too much emphasis on that one thing? So, so there's like something, you know, maybe it didn't clear it out that clearly in the Bible, but we know from the Bible that, you know, idols, anything that we look to is wrong thing. You know, idolatry is against God, you know. We have God as our center, as our base. He's at the top of our mountain in our life right there, and we're trying to get to Him, serve Him, please Him, live in Him, and these other things should be things that could just fall away or whatever. It's not that... You know, we can't have a beer or not that we can't do this or can't do that. But at a certain point, things could get trouble right there. But that's just one example. And uh, we can see, too, we can see that it says, says the desires of the flesh in verse 17 are against the desires of the spirit. The best other chapter I can think to relate to this, like I say, we look at the Bible as a whole, is Romans 6. Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I hate to do, I do do. This war that's going on within me. And some people are like, well, Paul wasn't a Christian then. Well, Paul was writing the book of Romans. He wrote quite a bit of other epistles too before he wrote that book right there. I think what Paul was was he was a very mature Christian. He realized that he did a lot of things wrong all the time. Just like us. If we're truly right with ourselves, all of us do a lot of things wrong all the time. None of us are going to make it to heaven by what we do right there. It's all by what Jesus did. And yet he strived. He wanted Christ in his life. He wanted to do the right things. 
But it wasn't always happening like that. And that's just something we have to realize. When we live in the flesh, there's sin. And it's going to be a struggle through our whole lives. You know, the Bible says in the Old Testament, it says, Choose this day whom you will serve. Each and every day we wake up, we've got to choose Jesus Christ. We've got to choose that we're going to serve Him. You know, it's good if you can wake up and uh, say a prayer to Him and thank Him. Be grateful and everything. Lift Him up and uh, ask Him, you know, forgive me, Lord. Help me get on the right path today. You know, help me leave yesterday in the past. And let me live today as today in the future in a way that glorifies you. And it's a it's constant struggle when I go through until we hit that last part of being saved, that glorification when we get lifted up. But at any time during that struggle, if we're cut down, we're with Him. It's not like we have to get to a certain height on the mountain to be safe, like uh, like maybe different video game levels or something. Like if you get to the certain video game level and you get killed, but you got so far, you get to stay at this level right here, and you don't have to go all the way back to square one. It's not necessarily like that. It's salvation right there, you know, we can mess up. We get forgiven and we keep moving on. You know, it's not like we're trying to work, work our, uh, to earn our salvation in any sense of the form right there. And it talks about these sins can be broken up right here. And these sins that we see, uh, cited right here, we see, we see that the works of the flesh are evident: sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Okay, these are all sexual sins, and the Bible is very implicit on this because we live in the flesh, so we have these kind of different sins. So that wraps up in one big group of sins. Another group of sins are religious sins, idolatry and sorcery. That's religious sins right there, like maybe uh, psychics, mediums, astrology, uh, false religions, superstitions. There's all kinds of things that can be wrapped up in this. I know one thing about this word sorcery that's kind of neat is it goes to the word pharmacy. And the word pharmacy is for the word drugs right there. And they associated the biblical writers and things with drugs, with sorcery, and witchcraft and things. Like people would take these, maybe, maybe I don't know if they had hallucinogenic drugs. I thought they had mushrooms and things like that, because they're natural things back then. But they had these kind of things, and they would associate it into their witchcraft and their sorcery and stuff. So, so in no time, I think, are, are, are drugs okay that aren't used for like medicinal purposes to help us or heal us or to do like the recreational drugs are usually a very bad thing. They can get your, get your judgments straight. That's one, one thing I think too, like with judgment, if you, that's probably a way to see if you're drinking too much or not drinking too much is if your judgment's straying and you're sinning when you drink, then it's definitely something wrong. You're, you're, Got to take out whatever's causing you to sin right there. It would be take out, you know, a few less beers or something like that. But uh, but that's why idolatry and sorcery is their religious sense. And like I said, idolatry could be uh, the addiction. It could be all kinds of things. Idolatry, you know, back then they had all these false gods and different things. They had like, uh, and they had like gods for fertility and they had this for uh, wealth or this for that. And it's almost, some of those things are some like still superstition now. Like I've heard people burying statues in their front yard for this or for that. That's all bad stuff right there. That's idolatry and it's not the right type of thing. But uh, now we have idolatry as in things we don't even realize in our lives sometimes we're completely controlling us. Like I said, just try to do an example maybe this week. If you think something may be too much of an idol to you this week, take it out of your life and see if you can cope without it right there. We shouldn't have anything that we can't cope without. I like, I always say this movie saying, some of you guys heard it, some of you haven't, but there's this movie called Heat, and there's a bunch of bank robbers. I don't know if you guys seen it, it's like a four hour movie. It's a pretty intense movie for an action guy like me, I liked it. But, but there's this movie called Heat, and I think it's Robert Nero, or Al Pacino, I always confuse the two. But one of them says to another bank robber, I think it's Val Kilmer, he says, if you can't drop everything in your life and move in 30 seconds, this is not the business for you. And I thought, that's like Christianity, too. That's where we're to hold Jesus in our life. If we can't drop everything and claim the Christ, then, then there's this problem going on right there. There's something that we have to deal with right there. Because that's the kind of place we have to have Christ in our life. Not that any of those things are bad that we would drop, but that's how much more our love for Christ is than anything else. And then we have another group of sins. Social sins. Enmity. Strife. Jealous fits of anger. Rivalries, dissensions, and divisions, and envy. All those are, are social sins, you know, things that every day we all run across right there. And like I said with my idea with debating, arguing, you know, discussing, disagreeing, but then provoking, fighting, war, there's a difference right there. You know, we can't let those kind of sins come in. We've got to be careful that we walk a fine line. And then it says uh, drinking sins, drunkenness, and origins, you know, because you drink too much. You get drunk and you drink too much, sometimes you do things that you would definitely regret. 
and things like these, he said, I warned you. And that says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's another place, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, talks about a bunch of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And what that's talking about, it's not, it's, and it says, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says, as were some of you, you know, before you were saved, this is what you did. So does that mean like that sin marred you, so now I can never inherit the kingdom of God? No, it doesn't mean at all. Every single sin in the Bible is forgivable. Everything is forgiveness. It's all forgiveness in Christ. The only sin that talks about the unforgivable sin is the sin that we turn away from God. God keeps trying to draw us. The Holy Spirit draws us. And we turn away. We're like, I don't want nothing of it. I don't want to get saved. I don't want anything to do with you, God. And then we die like that. It's impossible for that sin to be forgiven because we just pass from, uh, from death unto death right there. And it's, it's an impossible sin. But everything else is, can be forgiven. But those kind of sins should not describe the Christian and the believer, you know. It should be people in society are looking at you thinking, okay, that person's a Christian. They shouldn't be looking at you and be like, that person's a drunk. All I know is I see him at the bar every single night. Or that person's a, uh, that person's uh, so angry, all they have is this huge anger issue, and they go through life, and they're just completely angry, and they've got nothing but anger. That shouldn't be describing us right there. We should be being described as those who love our neighbor and love our neighbors ourselves. Somebody who's a Christian and a believer. So maybe that's another way for us to check ourselves is think, well, how do, how do other people view me? How do they see me through their eyes, not just my eyes? Because egocentric, egocentricism and narcissism is something we probably all have a bit of issues with. It goes right along with pride, and every single one of us all has pride. If you say you don't have pride, you have pride, and you just sin because you lie. <laughs> you said, don't have pride. That's the way that kind of works. It's like a catch-22. It says, like, you know... Do you have a drinking problem? No. Well, then you're in denial. No, for sure you're not. <laughs> That's not that thing with pride works. We all got some pride right there and some issues. But we shouldn't have those things described. But sometimes it's good to get an outside point of view and how are we, how are we viewed to the outside world. And then do some prayer with God and ask God to help us to change that. And it says, it says it talks about the fruit of the spirits and talks about all kinds of good things. But like I said, there's even more good things than that. And it says if we live by the Spirit, verse 25, that we'll also keep in step with the Spirit. You know, How are we saved by the Spirit? How do we stay saved by the Spirit? How do we get sanctified by the Spirit? Who take, takes care of us when we die? Takes us heaven, the Spirit right there. The Holy Spirit right there. And, uh, and that's a, a key, like with all that stuff, if you know you got sin in your life and you have a hard struggle with it, try praying. Start right when that sin started struggling. You're like, I'm about to do this sin and I know I'm about to do it. Just stop and start praying. Pray to God. And you may have to pray for more than just 30 seconds right there, more than two seconds, because this sin may have a strong pull on you. If that sin has a real strong pull on you, maybe you got to pray for five minutes. you got to pray for ten minutes. But pray until that desire goes away, until you're able to break that sin right there. Just pray. It's hard to stay one way and be the other way at the exact same time. So again, pulled one way and we put ourselves in prayer, it's hard for us to, uh, to want to keep sitting or something when we're trying to pray to God and be, be, be holy and be righteous right there. But here it says, uh, I, got, I got a couple more stories right here. And uh, I got them right here. And I've talked a lot about this guy all the time, Pilgrim's Progress. I'm going to talk about him again. <laughs> I love that book. In fact, you know what, soon, I just keep, people keep asking, what are we going to do after we get done reading through the Bible on Wednesdays? So I have a great Pilgrim's Progress study right there. It's really, really good. I got it from the Creation Museum. Maybe if there's interest, maybe we'll do that. But in Pilgrim's Progress, it was a book written in 1600 by a guy named John Bunyan, who was thrown in prison for like 12 years because he didn't have an ordination to preach the gospel. So he was preaching the gospel without the, uh, the stamp approval of the church. So they kept throwing him in jail. But John Bunyan wrote some incredible progress, and he wrote it to his children, because his children come to visit him in jail, and it was an allegory tale that they could understand about the Christian life. But John Bunyan describes the interpreter's house. He goes to this interpreter's house in the story, in which Pilgrim, that's the name of a uh, guy, Pilgrim, Christian or Pilgrim, Pilgrim entered during the course of his journey to the celestial city. The parlor of the house was completely covered with dust. And when a man took a broom and started to sweep, he and the others in the room began to choke and the clouds of dust are, oh, oh, oh. I don't know if you guys ever swept a really dusty room, especially anybody that's been around construction. I've done some construction to try to sweep up the work site and you can't even breathe. You end up getting bronchitis afterwards because all this dust is choking you in the air. That's how I picture this. The more vigorously he swept, the more suffocating the dust became. Then interpreter ordered a maid to sprinkle the room with water. 
with which the dust was quickly washed away. Interpreter explained in Pilgrim that the parlor represented the heart of an unsaved man, that the dust was original sin. The man with the broom was the law, and the maid with the water was the gospel. His point was that all the law can do with sin is to stir it up. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can wash it away. Isn't that a nice picture right there? And I like to paint pictures like that in your head because it's something you can kind of remember better than maybe trying to remember it. 15 different verses and try and connect them right there, but we really see it. Here's this lady, or here's you, trying to sweep up the room, get the sin out, get the bad stuff out, right? And all the dust is choking you, and you're not getting anywhere. Basically, all the bad sin is just, it's up on top of your head now, it's in your hair, now you're filthy, your body's covered with it. No matter what you do, you can't get it, can't get it done. And then, and then here comes this lady and sprinkles the water on And I've been in the Army for 20 years, and let me tell you, places like Afghanistan, I've even seen it Bosnia and Kosovo a little bit, but places where there's extremely like no grass or desert or all dust, and the car drives by and there's this giant cloud everywhere, and the stores don't like that because they have their fruits and vegetables and fresh meat standing right there on the side of the road and all this dirt sign. What they'll do is they'll come out there with their water and they'll splash it so it's not muddy, but it's dampened down. So when that car drives by or something, all the dirt and the dust doesn't go over all the vegetables, all the fruit and everything like that. And it points out here, it said that that water, what that is, is that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news, that he came to die for us, to pay the price for our sins, and that we're free. Free from all that. It's no longer choking us anymore. Now we can really live as we ought to live. We're free to live like we really need to live right there. And uh, that goes right into my, my next story right here. It says... It says, no one becomes biblically free until one accepts that he or she is enslaved to sin, self, and the world. Okay, so until you, like you get a lot of these people on, preaching on TV that really bother me because I never hear about the doctrine of sin mentioned at all. They talk about a lot of good things in the Bible, but they don't talk about sin. And we really can't have one without the other. Until we realize that we need a Savior, we won't really want a Savior, you know. They just kind of like offer Jesus as an added thing to help you out a little bit more with life over here. And that's the wrong impression. It says, it does no good to tell a prisoner who lives out his life on a lush resort, playing golf during the day and dancing the night away with wine, women, and song, that he needs to be set free if the things that he enjoys most are constantly available. Because that's the way it is. Prisoners of the world, the people are lost. You know, a lot of them are enjoying life as much as they can. They think they got what they want to have. It's hard to tell them, hey, you're a prisoner. It's like I tell people with church planning, you know, it's like kind of like a small business. But usually you make a small business where you fill a need and then you have, a, you know, it makes a big business. Well, when people don't know they have a need, it's harder <laughs> to, to build a church. Because people out there, they're like in the prison that don't even realize they need a Savior. Don't realize they need God. So it says, if, however, his greatest desires are on the outside, then he can be set free from his deprivation to do them. So also it does no good to tell persons they need to be set free from sin if they do not realize how awful their state is. As John Stoke says, true freedom is freedom from my silly little self in order to live responsibly in love for God and others. And really, that's true. I mean, he kind of slams us a little bit. He goes, freedom from my silly little self. But it really is sometimes like that. True freedom is freedom from ourselves that we can live responsibly for God in the right way and love others as we should right there. He said, like the whole law was summed up in one thing, love others as yourself right there. It was all about love. And uh, it says, this kind of individualism is creating and determining one's destiny. Hence, the typical Western adult is involved in a moral, social, and religious breakdown. You know, the typical person really is for our Western, Western people. I mean, people in the East, they got problems too. But just seeing the problems that we got going on right here. And... Uh, and then there's one other thing I want to tell you guys. Well, on, two more things, okay? But this other thing is, uh, is Moses, he gave the Ten Commandments. And when he gave the Ten Commandments, he also made this law, this ordinance, that he stipulated that if one Hebrew brought another Hebrew as a slave, they did have slaves. They had slaves all the time in history until maybe the last 200 years. You know, they still have slaves. If you guys don't realize, I've been to Africa. In Africa, one man can make another man his slave, and it's totally legal. In countries like Mauritania, Mali, slavery still does exist. And white slavery exists right now, too, in a very bad way from a lot of the Russian mafia and things. I've seen those things. So slavery still does exist. We're just blessed in this country that we don't have it anymore. It's a terrible thing. But here, in the Old Testament, you could have one Hebrew slave could be another guy's Hebrew slave. And it really wasn't the same type of slavery as what we have now. It wasn't racially orientated. This was like 
you know, a third of us could be slaves in here. You wouldn't be able to tell who's a slave and who's not a slave. And if you think about it, slavery then was instead of like a guy does you wrong and you go lock him up in a prison cell for the rest of his life, he could work for you and work off that wrong that he did you. You know, you could do that. Now, think about now how many people go in such heavy credit card debt and different things. Instead of going bankrupt and stuff like that and losing everything, they'd become a slave for a little while to earn their way back out of their slavery. That's how slavery used to be. Still wasn't a good thing because no man should be a slave right there. But there's a different picture on it. But it said... But God said, but if the slave plainly says, I love my master, I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God, then he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost. And the master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. Okay, this is kind of like our slavery to Christ. You know, we are a slave under the law. We're, we're lost. We don't have God. We're heading the wrong direction. And then we realize we get saved. And then what we do is we're like, but I, I want to be with you, God. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I want to dedicate my life to you. I want to serve you all days of my life. And it's like God puts that earring through our ear, you know. When I was a kid, some radical Christian guys would be like, I can have a pierced ear because that's what the slavery did on the time by myself with God. I think it was more than teenagers just want to have a pierced ear and tell us parents that or something like that. But the... Uh, but that was the thing, and that's, that's the picture of it is right there, that we're able to serve God permanently. We're no longer a slave like that. I mean, Christ calls us a brother. You know, God calls us his son, adopted sons. It's not like some slave relationship where God's just going to deal out a whole bunch of pain and suffering and throw it on top of us. No, we're his sons, his adopted sons. He loves us as much as he loves Jesus Christ, because we are his adopted sons when we are believers right there. So it's a whole different picture of slavery than we know from our American experience right here. But... Uh, Points out Romans 6.22, that having been free from sin, they willingly begin the joyous privilege of becoming enslaved to God. Because we're all going to be slaves to something. That's just the way we're made. We're built to worship. We're made, built to follow something. We're either going to follow God or we're not going to follow God. So we want to make sure we're on the track following God. And here's a point, too. Do you know that even though Paul talked all this stuff bad about the circumcision in Acts, Paul circumcised Timothy. Timothy was what they call like a, a hail Jew or something. It wasn't like a pure Jew. It wasn't circumcised. And Paul circumcised him so that he could preach to the Jews and be a better witness to them. Not for salvation, not for freedom or anything. So it's like, whoa, whoa, Paul talked so bad about circumcision, yet he circumcised Timothy, which was, like his, was his prodigy that he was raising before he got killed to continue on the church. But that was just so that way he could relate to them better. You know, say maybe... Say maybe if a whole bunch of bikers came to this church right here, and it was almost all bikers, maybe I'd want to grow my hair a little longer to identify with them because they'd be like, they'd be like, Buck just always looks like this weirdo to us. But if I grew my hair longer, I'd identify. Like in Afghanistan, special forces, we would grow our beards real long and have all this different stuff. So that way when we talk to these Muslim guys, but to them they thought you were a girly man if you didn't have big facial hair right there. They really did. That's what they think. We were able to identify. And they knew we weren't an Afghani or a Muslim, but they thought this guy has enough respect for me that he likes to look like me. You know, so for things like that, it's okay, but it's not for your salvation right there. And, uh, and then uh, here's a story about an artist. Another great story. I'm almost done. The story is told of an aspiring artist who was commissioned to do a large sculpture for a famous museum. Okay, I like this story because this week, me and my family went to the art museum in Cleveland. Totally free, highly recommended. And when you walk through the art museum, you'll see Jesus Christ all over the place. Painted from, uh, from the year 100 on, they've got paintings. It's tremendously incredible, the story of Christ told in the art museum. It's not a religious organization at all or anything, but how much art depicts Jesus it's just amazing right there. I don't know how anybody can't not think about God when they go to the art museum. And it's a beautiful museum. I highly recommend it. I want to go some more myself. And it's free. It's even better. They don't even check your ID or anything. They, you walk in, they be like, here's the map. We glad you're here. And it's like, wow, does that feel nice? <laughs> but here's the story of this aspiring artist. He wanted to do a large sculpture for a famous museum. At last, he had the opportunity to create the masterpiece he had long dreamed of. After laboring over the work for many years, he saw it grow not only in shape, but in beauty. But it was finished, he discovered to his horror that it was much too large to be taken out of the window or door, and that that cost of tearing down part of the building in order to remove it was prohibited. His masterpiece was forever a captive to the room in which it was created. That is the fate of all human religions. Nothing a person does to earn God's favor can leave the room of this earth where his self-made works are created. Think about that. I gave this another analogy too, 
is a man with a boat. You know, here's Jesus coming along with a boat. This big flood's just happened. Here's this man with his boat, and his boat's kind of sinking, and he has all the favorite treasures of his life in there. He's got his little treasure box that's real heavy in his boat. And Jesus reaches out his hand to the man. You know, like Jesus says, I knock at the door, and who will answer right there? Whoever opens the door, I'll come in unto him. Jesus reaches out his hand to the boat and says, come with me, and I'm going to save you right now. And the man says, wait, wait, i got to grab my treasure. I have this treasure. I took it from my house when I ran and left, and I'm not going to leave without this treasure. And he's like, my boat doesn't have a place for your treasure, but it has a place for you in my boat. And the guy thinks, no, 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 this treasure is way too important to me. Kind of like this large sculpture the guy made, and they couldn't get out of his house. He was trapped there forever. And you've got to be able to, like the man, 30 seconds, man, we've got to be able to leave that behind. And Christ should be our extreme treasure, what we hold on to above every single thing else in life. It's worth more to us than anything else we treasure. And that's the value that Christ is in our life. All right? And to add, any human effort or act of God's gracious provision through his death of his son is to exchange the saving gospel of Jesus Christ for the damning falsehood of paganism. You know, paganism's all about me. Think about all the Greek mythology stuff and all these guys that were just like we were and they sinned and they fought and they got in these little feuds and adultery happened and crazy things happened with the gods. It's because they were just mirroring themselves and their false religions right there. And almost all false religions, you can find that kind of mirror of the sinful self. Well, you won't find it. Jesus is the only religion where God himself died for us, became the suffering servant, and gave his life, and rose from the dead the third day. None of the other ones have made by rising from the dead. And uh, says we should obey him. Our faith is manifested by obedience. If we believe God, we obey him. If we do not obey him, it's because we do not believe him. We trust and obey. As we do these things, we walk and live by the Spirit. You know, that's what's manifested. That's how we can kind of tell if we're saved or not. Am I living a life that follows God, or am I living a life that follows something else? Another way we can do an outside perspective on ourselves. And uh, I wanted to give a good story, a praise this week happened. We were at Bible study Wednesday night, and this girl came, and... This young guy, Chris, that comes to church sometimes was there, and he brought this young girl. She was a 17-year-old girl from Brunswick High School, and we were taking prayer requests, and she, she says she wants prayer for salvation. And I said to the girl, I'm like, you're not saved? She said, no, I'm not a Christian. And I said, well, this is the best prayer request we've ever had in this Bible study. This is amazing. I said, this is great. And I explained what salvation was. I explained how important it is. I said, it's the most important day in your entire life, the day you decide to follow Christ. And she started crying a little bit. And uh, I was just amazed. I was like, this is incredible. And we prayed for her. And then uh, we prayed for her again outside. More people want to pray for her too. <laughs> it's broken a lot of prayer. But it was so wonderful. And I even sent her a message. And she wrote me back. And she's still... Wants to know more about God. She wants to grow, and I'm doing what I can so that I can help her. But uh, it was just so amazing. It made me so happy. I thought, here's a life that's changed. You know, our whole Bible study the whole year has been great. It's helped us all. But this person, it just helped her in just one night to see eternity. Now she's set free for eternity. It's not just about little problems right here that we suffer with here and now. She's set free for eternity right now. I thought it was beautiful. I'm sure we're going to see her soon. So when we see a young lady... Greet her and say, hello, how are you doing? So glad to have you here. She, she's, she works at Burger King, and she had to work today. But may, maybe she starts getting some Sundays off soon or something like that. So it'll be wonderful. But I'm so happy about that. But that's how it is. And, and when we're following, what we were doing our Bible study, we weren't like telling everybody you have to be saved, this and that. We were just talking about the Bible. We were going through the Gospels, and she just heard all that truth, and it just affected her. It affected her in such a deep way. I didn't even know it was affecting her while we were all talking. She was real quiet the whole time. But if we go through life loving our neighbors, ourselves, trying to serve God the best we can, loving Him, it's going to radiate. It's going to shine out. And other people are going to want what we have. And that's what we're really called to do, the great commandment, to go and tell. You know, you know, put the gospel forth. You know, it's for their love. It's for, it's for them. It's what it's for. It's not for us. You know, we, we're not trying to profit off of them or anything like that. We're just trying to show them love and, and bring it to them. And uh, so it was an amazing thing. So... So what I ask you guys to do this week is to examine yourselves, see if there's some kind of legalism that's kind of holding you back from really following God or being free in God, and also uh, see that you're really free in Christ, that you're able to follow Christ, that you're actually obeying Him, and that you're following Him too. I think those are the two biggest things we get from this. But if you guys will bow your head, we'll go ahead and pray, and we'll take communion.
Jesus, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for each and every single person that's here, Lord God. Lord, I thank you for this word that you've given us in your Bible that you've kept preserved for so long, Lord Jesus, and that you continue to preserve for us, that we may grow and live by it, Lord, even more than the bread of bread itself. Lord, you said that you are the bread of life, and that we, we take part in you, Lord, that's the only way that we can live, Lord. And Lord, as we get ready to take this communion, Lord, as it symbols your body, broken for us, your blood spilled for us, as a, as a symbol is the only way that we have the life, Lord Jesus, is by identifying ourselves with you, is by, by, by realizing that we're a sinner, that we're hopeless, that there is nothing we can do to earn our way or to be good enough to go to heaven, Lord, but it's all what you did on that cross that day. And that night before when you broke the bread, and you, and you poured the cup and you shared it with each person, Lord, and you said to do this in remembrance of me until the day that you return, Lord. We do that today. Lord, we do it and we proclaim you. We proclaim that we believe in you. We identify ourselves with you and that we love you and we're in a relationship with you, Lord, that will never end. Not billions of years from now, now never, Lord, do we ever want a relationship with you to end. And Lord, I ask you that before we take this communion, that if we have sins within us, Lord, which we all have sins that we deal with constantly, Lord. Lord, that we'd ask for forgiveness from you for these sins. That you cleanse us, Lord, just as you said you would. You said in 1 John 1, 9, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we ask you for forgiveness, Lord, if we confess them and ask you. Lord, I ask you that, that we'll give a moment here in a moment. We'll have a sign of prayer that each person would confess their sins quietly to themselves, to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, that they would get right with you. Lord, that if they would have any animosity or anger issues, Lord, or, or something that's worse than just reasoning or debating about something with somebody else, something that causes them to not even be around them, Lord, that they would ask forgiveness from you for these things. And Lord, that they would forgive those persons in their heart right now, Lord, that no longer would that be controlling them or influencing their lives or oppressing them, Lord Jesus but that they could be free in your spirit and in you. Even if the other person doesn't forgive them, Lord, I know that your forgiveness and their forgiveness, Lord, is enough to free that person right there, that they will walk in your freedom and not walk with a head hung lower in fear, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I thank you so much for dying for us, for coming to the flesh for us, Lord Jesus, for, for taking care of us and guiding us, for showing us your truth, Lord Jesus, for giving us all these wonderful opportunities that we have, and for blessing us so very dearly, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I ask that you be with each person, Lord, and help them throughout the week, help them throughout their lives, Lord, as they live, that they live unto you, and that they live in the fullness that you made for them to live. In Jesus' name I pray. Please take a moment to pray to God yourself for one, one short moment.